Welcome to Real Steve TV, the hottest in electronics, sporting arts, and Bible studies. Okay, again, maybe that's over the top. Welcome to Industrialized Bible Studies and the hottest in gaming representative technology. All right. So tonight is Bible Study Wednesday. Tonight we're going to be in the book of John. I don't think we have any viewers yet, but... I don't know if the sound is, I, is the video game sound too loud? <coughs> Thornsy, hey, hey, how are you, dude? Welcome, sir. I'm good, my man. How are you doing? Yes, dude. Sweden, unite. Thornsy, do you have a place to crash? I might have to leave the States by the end of 2024, the way things are going. <laughs> I, I won't get into it. I just stay biblical up in here. I'm a Christian, and I like playing video games. Sue me. Can you get sued for that in America now? Can I get canceled for that, you know? <laughs> Thornsy, doing good, thanks. Glad to hear you're good. Haha, <laughs> what you mean? What's up in the U.S.? Um, I only have my culture to compare it to because I've never lived anywhere else. I've never really been outside the country. I've been to, like... Juarez, Mexico, which is on the border, so it's not it's not deep into Mexico, but our country's just going through a rough time lately, man. Like ever since three years ago and the, the pandemic and all, things have just gotten real tense, like politically, economically. Um there's a lot of like tension building up to this year's election between Trump and Biden. And just, just a lot of stuff that's been going on that's basically, I, I feel like it's the first time in many years that Americans kind of feel like our country's unstable. You know, we've been the world leader for so long, and I'll be the first to admit our country has become very arrogant. Um, here in America, we're raised like I was, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. We're raised to literally believe like we're number one. We're number one. America's number one. We're number one. And there's nothing wrong with that, but there's something wrong with having an arrogant attitude about it. Like, we're not humble about You know, if we were the world leader for all those years, we weren't humble about it. We were arrogant about it. And uh, things are kind of getting a little unstable. And I just don't think average Americans are handling it well, basically. You know, and I'm sure you know, you saw like three years ago after the pandemic, the George Floyd protests that rocked our nation. I mean, there was like massive protests and riots in, in most major cities in America. Um, I hadn't seen anything like that since the 90s with like uh, Rodney King. So it's just a long history, dude. Dude, we're, we're a bloody nation. And it's funny... Um, uh, okay, I'm obviously watching it from the outside, but from my point of view, it feels like the U.S. is just getting more and more polarized. Yeah, and then there's that. So that's what I mean, like, politically, the the Democrats and the Republicans, right? The left, the right, red, blue. It's like at an all-time high tension where they're just, the politicians are at each, other, at, each other, at each other's throats. And that's gotten very, like, tense, you know? Like, literally, friends and families getting into arguments about it and stories of, like, oh, we don't go over to the, their house anymore because they support Biden. Well, we don't go over to their house anymore because they support Trump. It's it's gotten crazy. Stuff like that, man. Like, friends and family of years being divided over this political stuff. And that's why, I guess, this is where my faith comes in. There's something... to as a Christian, I believe there's something much deeper going on than our physical lives. And I'm not saying our physical lives are not unimportant by any means, but I'm saying like there is something deeper that we all feel in our heart, in our spirit, in our soul. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna break this down to three things, guys. I ask everybody to do this. There's three questions that help me, like assisted in me and my faith and believing in the Bible, believing in Jesus, believing that Jesus is the Son of God. Like, two or three questions. The first question, is there truth? So let's take Jesus and Christianity out of it. 
this can go for wherever someone is at in their life. You ask yourself, is there truth? This is an epic age old question that philosophers and Socrates and Plato, whatever discussed, right? Is there truth? I came to the conclusion. Yes, there is truth. There has to be truth. If there's truth, is there a God? Is there an all supreme omni omnipresent omni omni omnipotent being God, the one that we all think of in general, when you think of what God means, the one who created everything, the universe, the world, that then I came to the conclusion. Yes, there has to be. And then the third question was, who is he and can he be known? Well, that's it. Scared my dog. I don't think my dog's saved, guys. Doug, do you believe? You can barely see his body by my mic. There. I won't. All right, he's sleeping. But so those three questions: Is there truth? Is there a God? Who is God? And that's helped, like, kind of guide me in my, I don't know, my journey to who I believe Jesus Christ is God. Which that brings us to our. The point of this evening's studies, ladies and gentlemen. So tonight's the Bible study night. I've been doing Bible studies on Wednesdays um, instead of gaming for the last. This will be the fifth one. Wow, time flies. Seems like yesterday I started doing this. Uh, perfect segue, Thornsy. Um, so my thoughts on it are that Jesus is who we claim to be in the Bible. Jesus makes some ordinary extraordinary claims and it boiled down to two things for me either he's an insane lunatic right because there's been many people throughout history who've claimed to be jesus christ the son of god the messiah the christ and so <laughs> all those people those people prove to be lunatics I'm like, clearly you're not, you know, there's been a lot of cult leaders in our country, in America. There's been cult leaders in other countries too. There's been people who claim to be Jesus Christ. And I'm my first thought with those people. I'm like, get your own, pick your own de deity. Hello, Jesus Christ. The original one already came and did that. Whether you believe he's the son of God or not, there's ample historical evidence and facts that he was indeed a living person. Okay, now believing that he's the son of God, that he died and raised again from the dead is a whole different thing, right? But in the least, if you're an educated historical person, there's enough evidence that proves there was a man named Jesus Christ. But um, I thought to myself, Lord, either you're insane, I guess, like every other person who's claimed to be Jesus Christ or what you said about yourself is true. And it all connects to back to, is there truth? Is there a God? Who is God? You know, and this has sent me on like an epic journey in my life because I'm not going to sit here guys and come off like the cliche Christian or the stereotype of a Christian that I've been this good little boy my whole life. And I read my Bible every day and I've prayed every day and I gone to church every Sunday. I haven't, man. I've lived a rough life, and I would say the majority of my life has been this epic wrestling match with Jesus or God. Because again, I believe Jesus is God. So my journey has been an epic wrestling match with God. Um, and it's been a painful process, but I'm also like grateful for the wrestling match. Um, I think to find the truth, we all have to go through it, really. I really believe that, man. I believe if we want to get to the truth, it's not going to get easy. It's not going to be just this easy thing. It's going to be a process, you know? So good question. Thornsy in the chat. Have you been a Christian all your life? Um, this is a good question. Y yes and no. So I was born and raised in a, it was like a Baptist church vibe, though I don't, I think it was like sort of Baptist vibe, vibe. And yes, I was raised and born as a little kid, a little boy. I can remember going to church as far back as my earliest memories. And my grandma, um, my grandma, her name is Judy. She, 
she instilled faith in me at a very early age. So I do remember as a little boy having total faith. Like in the Bible even talks about it. Jesus tells his disciples, unless you have faith like that of a child, and he, he's referring to child's, children, child's children, and he points to the little kids and he says, unless you have faith of a child, something to the effect of like, you can't have faith or you can't enter into heaven. Like you have to have faith that is that pure, you know? And I had faith as a kid, but like I took it for granted because when you grow up in the church, you're taught that you've been saved by Jesus. And so I fell into the trap of like, well, so I'm say since I'm saved, I guess I can do whatever I want, including sin. And then like I, at an early age, I started smoking marijuana and then later on developed alcoholism, um, lost my virginity when I was <laughs> this, I'm just being straight up honest. I lost my virginity when I was 22 and then from the age of 22 until recently, like I've struggled with sexual sin and having sex outside of marriage, which I think, I think being a, a, an addict to any drug or alcohol is a sin. I'm not saying that having a beer once in a while is a sin. I'm not saying, I don't know, smoking weed once in a while is a sin. Um, but I am saying that smoking and drinking all day, every day, you know, getting drunk all the time, that is a sin. It's just too much. And then I do believe that sex out of, outside of marriage is just not good. Um, sex outside of marriage has led to the most painful experiences experiences of my life because of breakups. I don't know why I said no, I, no quotes. I didn't mean quotes. Like the breakups I've gone through with women have been the most dark and painful experiences of my life. Um, and you think I would have learned my lesson, but I'm a work in progress. And now everything that's like panning out globally, the way the world's changing, I, it's really on my heart to talk about Jesus to other people and, and tell them the truth. And if that inspires someone, if that brings someone to Christ, amen. If everyone laughs at me and thinks I'm an idiot and they're like, oh, you believe in a fairy tale? Amen. Only I, Steve Forrest, can make the decision to put my faith and belief in Jesus. And that's everybody's individual choice to make, right? You can boil people into those two categories. People believe Jesus is who he says he is. And other people believe it's not true. And it's a lie. And it's a fairy tale. And all the, all the reasons, excuses that people come up to say they, why they don't believe, you know? But we're getting to a point in history with the advent of the internet, Google. Um, there's been no excuse for us to like Google and look up facts and really find facts about anything, including Jesus Christ, the Bible, Christianity. Um, and the more I study it and look into it, to me, it's just it always comes up as like there is evidence. There's historical evidence that this is true. I also believe Jesus is spiritual and he comes into our lives and he does something much more profound than just proving factually, historically that he's real. I believe he comes into people's lives and he changes you from the inside out. And again, that can be a long process or a quick process. You know, I, I don't know. Everyone's different. But for me, it's been this like long, drawn out, just knock down, drag out battle. Um. So, yeah. And then I, I saw, like, it's so funny, Thornsy, like, just randomly watching stuff on YouTube. I saw, I can't remember what I was watching, but it reminded me of you in, in Sweden, I guess, in that part of the world. And someone was saying, it was a woman, I think, who was from Sweden. Was it Sweden? I don't know if it was Sweden or Iceland or, or whatnot. Or Switzerland, I can't remember, but it was one of those northern cold countries. And she said, like, in our culture, like, there is not that many religious people. And she said, like, in high school, she went to school and most of the students were not religious. They don't believe in the Bible or God or Jesus or anything like that. But she said the one kid in our class who was, like, a Christian, 
got mercilessly made fun of and picked on and stuff. And I actually thought about you, Thornsey, because like, because you're from Sweden and I thought about you and I thought I, I've never even thought about how other cultures are and what they think of Christianity or the Bible, um, whatnot. And then from what my limited knowledge, really, I don't know much about other cultures and stuff. And I need to know, I need to learn more about all that. But from what my limited information, I believe there's like a lot of pagan beliefs in those like Northern Nordic countries, um, which makes sense to me. But again, I don't know for sure. It's just limited knowledge I have that I see stuff in documentaries and stuff. Um, Thor Thornsey, haha, I was just writing something about religion here in Sweden. The girl called M with the dancing dinosaur emoji. Funny you just said that. Okay, interesting. And what were you... Okay, I, tell me what you were writing about l religion. I'm curious. And then secondly, here's the thing. A true relationship with Jesus Christ is not religion. And this is why I believe God is a person that you can know. Jesus was a person. His spirit lives on in eternity forever with God the Father. So th this is where it all kind of connects. A lot of Christians have it wrong. And it is religion to them. It, it's, it's, um, I talked about it last week. People look at God. A lot of Christians here in America look at God as going to church on Sundays. And you check the box off of your good li list of deeds that you've done. And you say, I go to church on Sunday, I'm a Christian. So first of all, I wanna say, there's nothing wrong with going to church every day on Sunday, but your motivation and why you go and your relationship with Jesus Christ is more important than your actual going to church every Sunday. Um, I go to church because I love Jesus. There's a lot of times I do not wanna go to church. I'm lazy. I don't want to take the time, the effort, but, but I always pray or oftentimes I pray and I say, Lord, I'm going because of you, because I love you and I want our relationship to be good. And nine out of 99 out of a hundred times, me and my friend, Michael talked about this, but when we go to church in general, we feel better afterwards. Hey, that's good. I mean, there's rarely a time I come out of church feeling worse. I usually feel better. And it's nice to be around believers. I know that I'm in a room with people who some of them have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know what I mean? I don't think they all do, but I think a good portion of them do. And so when we're all gathered together, singing songs, worshiping him, I can feel the manifest presence of God in that place. And it's a refresher. It's water. Jesus called himself the living water. And, you know, a metaphor. He's, he's living spiritual water. That water is more important than physical water. We need to drink of that water. And when I go to church, I get a sip or a, 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 I get to drink of that water. No wonder I feel better when I leave church. You know, no wonder I feel inspired, encouraged to keep going, keep fighting. The girl called him, God is a personal being because he created the universe. He had to have made the choice to create. Therefore, he is a personal being. God is a personal being because he created the universe. He had to have made the choice to create. Okay, interesting. Awesome. Right? I mean, he could have chose not to make it. I have no idea the mind of God. You know, obviously he's God. He's all-knowing, all-powerful, all that. So we don't know necessarily what's on his mind. I think we can kind of know based on the Bible and having a relationship with him. We can know a lot about him, but we can't know everything about God. And I'm fine with that. I mean, why would I, how could you get smarter than God, you know? Thornsey, well, religion here is just mostly connected to certain Christian traditions. Christmas, etc. Right, right. Other than that, it's very uncommon to be an active Christian. I have never met a person that goes to church regularly, for example. Okay, interesting. Awesome. See, and I would say in our culture, it's, well, we're in a weird time. So many pastors in America have said the church since the pandemic has been on the decline. Attendance has gone down in general. 
Um, churches have shut down, you know, there's less churches, I think, than at the start of the pandemic than now. A lot of pastors reporting that their the number of uh, people in their congregation has gone down. But for the majority of America, we've been a Judeo-Christian nation. But as I'm waking up out of the dream, I'm, I'm looking around and seeing like, again, talk is cheap. That's all I can say. And I've been a a talk Christian most of my life. I, I said it with my mouth, but I wasn't living it. And I wasn't pursuing a relationship with Jesus day in and day out. I was just kind of like, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. Um, this is the metaphor I use for it. I treated Jesus like he was this little statue. And when I needed him, I would dust him off and I would pray and worship. And then once I thought I had everything back together, I'd put him back on the shelf and say, cool, I'll see you when I need you again. And I'm here to tell you that's not a that is not a good way to have a relationship with God the Father Jesus Christ. That's really terrible, and it actually kind of shows a lack of uh, being unfaithful. You know, I, I I treated him like he's this thing that I can control and I can get him when I need him, and then I can put him away when I don't need him. And I'm here to tell you guys that is not how a relationship with God works. I mean, imagine if you have a friend or a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a husband or a wife imagine if you treated them that way the girl called him i mean that's how that's how we know he is personal one of the ways right that's cool i never thought of it that way but that makes sense thornsey however i've felt like as i've gotten older i'm discussing more and more spiritual topics with my friends and family it, that's in, that's interesting um, I personally believe that we are at a crossroads with what's going on in the world. I believe a lot of people are going to come to Jesus in this time. And I also believe a lot of people are going to fall away from Jesus during this time. Um, again, that's just my opinion. I could be totally wrong. And ultimately, I said this last week, ultimately, we're always at a crossroads in our lives of seeking the truth. I don't know where anybody's at in their their lives their walk totally only you and god know that i don't know if you know someone's a complete atheist and hap believes not at all i don't know if someone's curious and they're studying different religions and trying to figure it out and see which if any of them call to them i don't know if you're a, a christian who's like seeking god every day and as us christians call it on fire for god and and, and working on your relationship all the time or as much as you can um, so what I'm getting at is I encourage people to seek out the truth. That's why I was saying the first question that I advise people asking themselves is, is there truth? You have to ask yourself that is there truth? Then let that be a thing that guides you to seeking out the truth, because I believe if there is truth, it'll be found taking it further as a Christian. God says, if you seek me, you will find me. That's a promise that will be fulfilled and it might be scary. It might be uncomfortable. It might be confusing, but through that struggle of seeking God, you will find God. Yes. Yes. And, uh, I've wrestled, like I said, I've wrestled with God for the majority of my adult life. And he's kind of taken me into this broken place where I don't want to wrestle with him the way I have anymore. He wins. He's God. Um, let's, so before we, well, I'm just, I'm letting the Holy Spirit guide this. So I want to look up what is the scripture where Jacob wrestles with God. Some Christians will pick a single verse that represents their kind of walk with God. Um, which I think is really cool. Like a lot of Christians will say, oh, this is my life verse. This is the verse that like speaks to me or means a lot to me or represents my relationship with God or represents my testimony or the one that's the most inspiring to me or, or whatever. This isn't Genesis. We're going all the way to the beginning, ladies and folks. Genesis 32. And what a beautiful number it is. This kind of, I can relate to this scripture so, so much, and it's beautiful. 
ja yeah, here we go. Jacob wrestles with God. So this is in Genesis 32, 22. I'm starting at 22, actually. The same night, so we're talking about Jacob, one of the founders of Israel. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of, day, of, day, of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you, you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of his thigh. Um, first of all, may I say, that's sick. That story's sick, first of all. Whether you're a believer or not, that's tight. That, to me, is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. I don't understand it completely or fully. I'm not going to... No, I'm not gonna say that I do. I want. I, sh I need to study it more if it's my favorite one. But there's evidence that we do wrestle with God. It's not always this. I gave my life to Jesus. He snapped his fingers, and everything in my life was perfect and beautiful. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of evidence that when we come to God, there's going to be a lot of trials and tribulations in our lives to test us in our faith, and that's part of the deal. I mean, let's face it, believer or not. We all have trials and tribulations in our lives. Um, life has ups and downs. We have good times. You know, we have successes. We have failures. We have defeats. And that's just life. Um, and so to me, you know, as a guy who feels like he's wrestled with God, I can relate to that a lot. And then I still don't, I'm yet, I still think of this, but it's like, it implies that like Jacob, Jacob, fought like he said you have striven you have striven with god and men and you have prevailed you know it's like he didn't stop fighting until he got his blessing and he also got permanently hurt in the process because he was wrestling with god you know so it's like well that's dangerous um and he walked away with a wound that he would what did it say he limped forever it said there uh, the sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel limping i don't know if it was a <laughs> i don't know if it was like a a day limp or if it was a lifetime limp you know what i mean but i mean i bet it was pretty bad dude you're like why are you limping you're like god touched my socket my hip socket the girl called him he limped his whole life after that okay good i didn't know it says right here in verse 31, it's the sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel limping because of his hip. But like there might be more supplemental uh, scripture or evidence or whatever that I, I could see it. I mean, come on, if God dislocates your hip, hey, you're not like, oh, I'll just walk it off, walk it off like it's a shiner in baseball. No, dude, it's not just a shiner in baseball, dude. Thornsy, I just feel like I have realized that there is some sort of void in our society where Christianity, for example, could help a lot of people. Amen. And I, I would just encourage you, Thornsy, wherever you at, you know, I just as a believer who believes, I would just say pursue that back to that. If you seek God, you will find him. I uh, challenge everyone to pray this if they're on the fence or they're wondering. Jesus, if you're real, reveal yourself to me. That's it. That's it. Pray that with some faith. Let's just say, Jesus, if you're real, show me that, please. And he will, if you seek him, he will, he will, find, he will find him. 
The Bible says also he knocks on the, the, the door of our heart. He's knocking on the door of, of mankind's heart on every individual. He's knocking. He wants to come in. Trust me, he wants to come and, and live there. And the Bible says he will dine with us and he will sup with us. And he will make like our heart his abode. He wants to live in us. Thornsey, our society as in our very atheist society here in Sweden. Yeah, yeah. If that makes any sense. It totally does, man. It totally does to me. And to me, there's like... So think about it. And again, I'm talking from the point of view of a non-believer. I'm always trying to put my shoes in a person who doesn't believe. Because I want to reach people who don't believe. Because I do believe. But... Like, if this world was recreated by a God, and he loves us the way Christianity teaches, imagine to be cut off from that relationship. Something will, it'll be a vacuum. There's going to be an empty vacuum. My wrestling with God was, you use the word void, right? Did you use the word void? Yeah, yeah, void. And, um... You know, I mean, let's do, we're going, we're, we're getting into it this evening. I'm going to see what's the definition of void. Cause that word comes up a lot. Uh, definition of the word void, not valid or ling legally binding, uh, lawyers, the eh, lawyers, not valid or legally binding is the first definition. Um, number two, completely empty. Uh, a completely empty space. And a bridge, a, a suit in which a player is dealt no cards. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. North American, declare that something is not valid or legally binding. Discharge or drain. Okay, so the one we're talking about is completely empty. And if, if, if God created to have a relationship with mankind, which I believe he does, when we don't have that relationship... We're ultimately going to be void. And I think that we can have, I think non-believers can be happy. And I think they could live actually very charmed lives. You know, I mean, there's, there's rich people who don't have God. And I think on the surface, they're viewed as like, they've got it all together. They've got money. They've got a nice life. They've got a nice house. But deep in my heart, I don't believe that's true. That can't be true 24-7, even if you're a millionaire. You know what I mean? Millionaires can't stop from being broken up with or go through a divorce or lose their fortune or a son or daughter dying. They can't, like, escape the tragedies of life just because they're millionaires. Sure, they can have, I guess, a nicer day-to-day -day life, nicer house, uh, nicer car, security feeling like you know I'll, well i have money so like i don't have to worry about food or rent or all that and that's great and there's nothing wrong with like having that that's not a sin but but i know in my heart there's something more than that and there's just evidence like we see celebrities and the crazy stories they go through we know that ultimately it's like well i guess the money and the fame doesn't like fix it like something's still missing when we see celebrities going off the deep end in the tabloids or in the news and you see these crazy stories that celebrities go through you're like you don't seem happy <laughs> you know and i've all, oh, that's always fascinated me i'm like how are you not happy you're rich and famous like what else you know what else could you want in the world that's because there's something deeper it's this relationship with god that we need like i back to jesus saying i am i'm the way the truth and the life i am living water he says drink from me and you'll never have to drink again yes and that's also echoing of eternal life. He's saying that if you believe in me, you're going to live forever. Your spirit is going on after this physical life that we're in now, and it's going on to be in paradise, heaven, no more pain, no more sorrow. I know we all want that. Come on. Come on. Who doesn't? Who, who, ah, sign me up. You know what I mean? Who, who would in their right mind say like, hey, do you want to live forever and you'll never cry again over something sad and you'll never have to worry about rent and you'll like be in joy and love for eternity? Nah, I don't want that. No, thank you. 
It would be like, I don't believe you. Who does it? Who wouldn't want that? Yeah, void, vacuum, whatever, thornsy, something like that. The empty space is what I was going for. Yeah, right. I get it. And I'll say I've struggled with it for a good portion of my life. All those years of partying, drinking, smoking, um, having sex outside of marriage, there was a void. And I was trying my hardest. And again, this is just my story. I think the void comes in different ways in different forms for different people. Not all people struggle with drugs, alcohol, and premarital sex. That was my, this is my testimony, my story. And no matter how much weed I smoked, no matter how much I drank, no matter how much I had sex, it would, the void wouldn't really go away. Maybe for a night, it kept it at bay. Maybe for, you know, a weekend out drinking each night with my friends, kept it at bay for a few days, but it never like truly was gone. And like I said, I can't imagine all the other voids that people feel. Back to rich and famous people, I, I think, imagine getting all the money you could imagine, all the fame you could imagine, having it and then being like, oh my gosh, I still feel the void. You know, my mansion didn't fix it. My uh, Lamborghini in the driveway didn't fix it. Um, you know, a bunch of women throwing themselves at me all the time. It didn't fix it. And that freaks me out. I tried the poor guy version of doing that. <clears throat> it doesn't work. I'm not rich and famous, but I did like the the peasants version of it. Woo! The poor man's version of being rich and famous. Okay, that's ridiculous, but it's fine. All right, so let's jump into the scripture. This has been an awesome way to like start this off. I prayed before and I said, Father, you just lead this like wherever you want. Like I did some light preparation. So we're again, we're going to the gospel of John. And I originally started in John because, because if anyone asked me, why do you believe that Jesus is, the, is God? Not only the son of God, but also that he is God. I would say you just have to read the gospel of John for yourself and study it and, and really get into it and look over these verses. But the evidence and the things Jesus says and does starts to jump out as like, oh, something's different here. He's not just a great prophet. He's not just a really smart guy. You know, he he's the son of God. So we're jumping the gospel of John and we're going to verse, okay, chapter one, verse 35. So the next day, um, the next day, again, John was standing with the two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, behold, the Lamb of God. All right, so we have to review right there right away. But remember, the Lamb of God, it was Jewish tradition and custom that they would have to sacrifice animals to atone for their sins for a lot of different reasons, for purification rituals, all this kind of stuff. And Jesus came as, as the Lamb of God. God required man to perform uh, sacrifice. And God comes with finally prophesied. This is prophesied in the Old Testament, but God comes with his sacrifice to humanity. Like, I've been requiring this of you. Well, I'm coming with mine. And it's in the form of my son. And I'm going to put my spirit, I'm going to put the spirit of God inside of a man. And he's going to walk this earth and live as a man and live a perfect sinless life. And when he's killed, that innocent blood freed us. It frees us in the spiritual realm. And, and also in this life that we're living now. But God freed us and gives, gives us forgiveness of sin, eternal life. Woo! I'll take it. And what do you have to do to earn it? Believe in Jesus. Whoop. That's the good news. The gospel means the good news. And that's it. You believe in Jesus. He is who he said he is. He, he did what he said he was going to do. He does what, you know, what we read in the Bible. He died. He rose again. He lived a sinless life. And because of that, we're forgiven for all our sins, all the sins we've committed, all the sins we're struggling in now, and all the sins we're going to commit in the future. He ended it once and for all and we don't have to die. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Um, 
It's a good sounds like a good deal to me. Thornsy, how do you as a Christian deal with making mistakes? Not the minor ones, but the ones that make you really question yourself and your ability. Huh. So this is an interesting question. So chime in with more questions, but from that from what you're sorry if I'm just throwing stuff out there, just no, no, no. I love this. I rather like talk about something that a viewer's interested than just ignore it because to me this is what's this is the important thing you know what i mean like i want like i said i prayed holy spirit you guide it you lead it wherever it goes you you take it but a few things but the ultimate thing is that and this is part of the struggle that i'm talking about this isn't just this snap your fingers everything's okay i'm gonna live a charmed life i'm never gonna experience bad things um i'm never gonna sin again and the, the devil uses those tactics on our mind because when we come to Christ, there is going to be a battle. And there's going to be a battle throughout our lives as we try, try to seek the Lord and follow him. But I want to read this again. How do you as a Christian deal with making mistakes? And I'm going to assume by mistakes, you also mean sin. Um, and in and, and the Jewish custom and times, this is called breaking the law. And in, in our times, we have modern laws. And I'm guilty of breaking laws. Um, the ones I can mention on camera comfortably are like I've stolen things in my life. Um, I've lied. You know, like it's technically illegal to lie, especially in a courtroom situation. You're not supposed to lie. I've never actually been to like on trial or to a trial as a witness, but I've lied. I've stilled. I've committed adultery. I wasn't. I'm not never been married, but I committed adultery with a married woman. Now there's two things. Um mistakes, sins. Here's the thing about this is back to this free gift. He forgives us of all of that. I believe for some people, this is why it's hard to come to him. Cause it seems a it seems this seems too easy or too good of a deal. And then because this is such a perfect, deep, profound love, us humans can't wrap our head around or believe or understand that God would die for us. Oh man, what's that scripture that says, oh, I think it's in Romans, like, rarely will a man die for another man. You know, it, it, it's not like, just think about having to die for a friend or a family member that's not an easy choice to make. And a lot of people say, again, talk is cheap. A lot of people say, I'd die for you, bro. You know what I mean? Like I've, I've heard this a million, I'd die for them. They'd die for me. I'd die for him. I'd die for my wife and kids. I mean, ultimately, I don't think you know that until you're in the position of making that choice. And I think the right thing to do is to die for a friend is to if you're a soldier in war and you have to take the bullet to protect your fellow soldiers like i mean they're trained to do that you know what i mean if you go to boot camp and all that they train you to sacrifice for the team the, the other guys right your brothers in a war and people are going to die and if you can save people again that's easier said than done you know i don't know what it feels like to be like oh man um i'm getting off on the tangents because i like that but our mistakes, men view mistakes and sins as like degrees. And this is reflected in the law. If you steal a candy bar and get caught, well, the punishment is less severe than if you deliberately murder somebody, right? It's like, well, that's obvious. Like that guy just stole a can candy bar. He doesn't deserve to go to prison. Maybe he has to pay it back and uh, I don't an hour of community service or whatever every country has different laws for different things right but the guy who steals a candy bar is not going to get the same punishment as the guy who murdered now all sin is sin to god and this is in light of holding up a sinful man against a perfect holy god so any infraction on the part of the sinful man in comparison to a perfect holy God is sin. And according to the Old Testament and even the new really, and I, according to the laws of nature is deserving of death. 
this is why death came into the world because of sin. Adam and Eve chose to sin. Flash forward to us, we choose to sin. And this is why we physically die. Now, you can accelerate that process. If you can commit a heinous crime and there's the death penalty, you can be killed early. You know what I mean? If your crime is bad enough and the death penalty is in that state or country or whatever, you could like die prematurely in a sense, right? Because of what you've done, you could be sentenced to death. So like that's even reflected in man's law. You know what I mean? If you do something heinous enough, you're we're killing you, sir. No, no. No disrespect. Sorry, sir, but you, you're you worthy of death now. But see, like on the grand scale of things, none of us escape death. We all know we die. And that's always been one of the driving things in my quest for truth and knowing God and is there a God is like one thing I knew is like we all die. That is one thing we share, whether you're rich or poor or black or white or free or slave you know what I mean? That's, that is the great equalizer, man. It's not like if you live a really good life or make a lot of money, you're like, cool, I, I escaped death. I made enough money. <laughs> or I lived a really righteous life. I was able to escape death. No, that's unheard of because you know what I mean? That doesn't happen. So really, Jesus died for all of our sins. Great, small, big, little mistakes. You know, sometimes I think things aren't even necessarily sin, but they are a mistake. And we look back and we think, oh, man, I, you know, I should have. Well, I don't know. Just I'm using examples off the top of my head. But, oh, man, I, I shouldn't have taken that promotion or I should have taken that promotion. Or, oh, if I would have just turned left instead of right that day, then this wouldn't happen. Oh, man, I, I sh you know, I shouldn't have done that. I should have done that. We look back and we think it could have gone better or or not. Um, but in regards to mis to sins, Jesus loves us so much he died for them. When you come to the knowledge of Christ and you believe that and you know that's the truth, something in our spirit changes and then we're forever changed because when you really believe that, you cannot help but change. You know what I'm saying? You're like, oh, wow, Jesus, you did all that for me? Well, I got to spend like, the rest of my life doing something for you. This guy put it perfectly, this YouTuber I watch. What, what is it? It's salvation. You know, salvation is a free gift from God. And there's nothing you can do to earn it. Um, and you just take that free gift from God. And when you really believe that, then it changes you. And you want to start living for God. And again, this might be a struggle. This might not come overnight. You are now engaged in this in this battle or the Bible says, Jesus says, pick up your cross daily. Every day is a day of like, okay, Lord, I'm going to follow you. You know, I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to try to cut these sins out of my life that I'm struggling with. I'm going to start doing good things for you. But none of those things are the things that are going to get you into heaven. You just want to change and live a good life because of what he's done for you. And then as far as the second part of your question, not the minor ones, but the ones that make you really question yourself and your ability. Well, I mean, and that's the other thing. I don't care what anybody says about any human. We're all broken to some deg degree, whatever it is, a physical ailment, your intelligence level, your looks, the condition of, of your spirit, your heart, your soul, the things you've been through. There is no perfect person. You know what I mean? There is no perfect looking guy. There is no perfect looking girl. Um, if you're blessed to be healthy your whole entire life, awesome. But most of us go through some form of ailments and sicknesses. Uh, all of us make, <laughs> like you said, different kinds of mistakes, little mistakes, huge mistakes. You know, you question your ability and think, oh, am I good enough? Or I didn't do it good enough, whatever. We have to like, just keep fighting through it. I, I believe God has also given us all gifts and talents. You know, you might be bad at some things for sure. 
you probably might be bad at most things, really. If I think of my life, I'm like, I'm actually not good at a lot of things. But I know God's blessed me with a handful of things that I am good at. And that already gives me direction of like, that's your already natural built-in gifts and talents. You're like, I guess that's probably a direction to pursue. I, I should probably go down that road, you know, because I do have those gifts or talents, whatever that might be. Um, um, a good communicator. Well, you might want to pursue a job in communicating. Uh, you know, you're, you've always been drawn to medical science and you, you have a good memory. Uh, maybe you should get into the medical field. You know, I, a million things that you could be talented at. That to me is a sign of like, there's no promises in life, but God's already inbuilt you with some things you can like go for. Like, huh, I'm drawn to this. Maybe that's a sign from God because he made me that I would be good at that, you know. But ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, keep fighting. That's been my theme for all these Bible studies. And it's directly connected to what I'm going through in life. But we just got to keep fighting. No matter how the battle is is going good or bad, we just have to keep getting up every day and trying again. And it's hard. And I've struggled with that. And I still struggle with that. But I got up this morning, guys. Everybody, Doug. Doug was here. I brushed my teeth. I went to a job interview to be a sales insurance. I don't, uh, sh sales insurance. Yeah. To sell sales and no sell life insurance, sales insurance, whatever. All right. So Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. John calls him the lamb of God. Then we're in John chapter one, verse 37. The two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. Yeah, you're welcome, Thornsey. I mean, I don't know if I answered it, but you guys know me. If you've watched me for any length of time, I can talk and I, I, I'll do it if I have to. <laughs> I never have a problem talking, so that's good. Um, all right, I'm going to jump to my notes. And that's why I love faith. Like, I think a lot of times we don't really, none of us know the answer or the outcome. But that's where faith in God comes out of like, you know what, God, I'm going to do my best and have faith. And something will pan out, maybe not the way you planned or thought. Maybe it will be the way you planned or thought, but the point is like, I, I got to have faith and I got to go and I got to try and I got to do. And maybe it works out. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it leads to something good. Maybe it doesn't. But we just keep getting up and, and fighting and trying. <laughs> Thornsy, to me, it was an answer at least. At least I didn't just skip it. But, um, you know, don't be too hard on yourself. And it's cliche, but... We make a mistake and then like everyone says, hopefully you learn from it and you're like, well, I won't make that mistake again, you know, and, and it's, that would be nice if it was always that easy, but we're stubborn. And sometimes we do make the same mistake over and over, um, and just keep fighting. We'll get it. So let's see, what does he say? So I wanted to talk about rabbis in Jewish culture. So they call Jesus rabbi right away. So basically, John says, look, here comes the, the Lamb of God, you know, and John's followers, you know, John has been preparing this time, telling them that the Savior of the world is coming. So John's disciples, in turn, as soon as they know and have confirmation from John who Jesus is, they go and they follow him. Like as we see here, here in the scriptures, no questions asked, no debating, no nothing they were prepared in a sense, like they had been being prepared by John. And when John's like, there he goes, dude, there's Jesus. There's the guy. They immediately follow him. Um, verse 38, Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? Dude, back to, if you seek me, you will find me. Here's Jesus saying with his very mouth, his very, what are you guys seeking? Jesus knows because he's God. 
And the, the relationship with Jesus is we need Jesus. Jesus doesn't need us to be who he is. God doesn't need us. Um, God, for some reason, wants us. That's a big difference. And you got to, th- that's a good one. So think about that tonight, ladies and gentlemen. God doesn't need me, but he wants me. Mm, that's a good one. Think of, let that stew enumerate. You know what I mean? If, if, if I don't come to God, will the universe and the character of God cease to exist because Steve Forrest doesn't come to God? Right? Do I have the, in my, in my broken uh, human, humanity, can I thwart God's plans? You're like, why did the world end? Because this guy, Steve, never believed in God. God's like, the whole thing was riding on, you know? And that's just a funny way of like, we can all say that. Like, will th- will it all end if you don't believe in God? So we need Jesus. We're seeking him. He has an answer for us, you know? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said, come and you will see. All right. So they seek him, they find him. And now he implores them, follow me. You know, so this is a clear metaphor for how this all works. Um, this, this connects in a great way. So even Thornsey kind of says like, you have this feeling that, you know, maybe the country society would be better if we believed in a God or God or Jesus. And I think a lot of people before they come to Christ, something is pulling you to him and you don't even know it yet because you don't know who he is, or you haven't confessed that you believe it, but something's pulling you to him. Right. And then when, when you meet him and you find him, he says, what are you seeking? You know, and it's like, we're seeking you. Okay, cool. Now come follow me. It's that simple. And that's how it works. And then this leads to this great adventure in your life. Most importantly, spiritually, but also physically where he's going to take you in your life, you know? Um, but okay. So they call him rabbi and it means teacher. So we're like, okay, I get it. You're a teacher, but think about it. They don't know who he is at all. Really? Except John says he's Jesus and he's the the Christ or whatever. And the, the, they're like teacher, like you're the teacher, right? So just so we have an idea during this time in Jesus's time, rabbi, um, it said, I looked it up. So it says in turn, the duties of the rabbi are first of all, to teach the Torah. Okay. And we'll touch on that in a second. And then a rabbi would train his disciples to emulate him and even surpass himself in knowledge and practice of the Torah. The rabbi was obligated to protect his disciples from heresy and from sin. Okay. So they already have a culture of student and rabbi, you know, and this is a big deal. And this is an honor to them. Like in their culture is like to be a rabbi is an honored position to be a teacher is an honored position. And this, this all makes sense to Jesus and the way he was and the things he said, but this part where he said he would train his disciples to emulate him. That's what we as Christians are essentially on the journey of doing. We are trying to emulate him. All right. And even surpass himself in knowledge and practice of the Torah. Now this gets dicey. None of us are going to be Jesus or, or better than Jesus or more perfect than Jesus. But he did tell his disciples you guys will even do greater things than I did, right? Someone fact check me on that. The girl called him, but he said something to the effect of like, I'm leaving you guys now, but I tell you the truth. Like you're, you're going to be able to perform miracles and cast out demons and build my church. You know, Jesus is like, I started the spark. You know what I mean? Like I started the modern day Christian church. We're living in what's called the the church age since the time that Jesus left or since Jesus's time till now scholars define this period of history as is the church age fact check the uh Jesus basically told his disciples like you saw me casting out demons and healing the sick and the blind and I tell you the truth like you will even do greater things than these fact check the girl called him half listening because of homework sinner she's sinning guys she's not paying full attention okay just kidding bad joke bad jokes he would train his disciples to okay so that jesus even echoes that thing later on is what i'm getting at 
And then the rabbi was obligated to protect his disciples from heresy and from sin. I love that, dude. And that's what Jesus does from, for us. He, he protects us. And specifically, he protects his disciples from heresy and from sin. Well, we know Jesus definitely protects us from sin. And then heresy, heresy is like speaking against the church or God. And Jesus protects us from that. That's crazy to think of it that way. And then back to the first part of what a rabbi is. Um, the duties of the rabbi are, first of all, to teach the Torah. Just as a recap and some quick Christian history, the Torah, just so everyone's clear, are the first five books of the Old Testament. Okay? And people don't always consciously realize this or know this, but um, the first five books of the Bible are like the Jewish Bible. Okay, so what is it? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and De Deuteronomy, I guess. Yeah, those are the first five books of the Old Testament. Those are from the Jewish Hebrew Bible, right? I'm telling you guys, Jesus is the bridge. He was the bridge from Ju Judaism to Christianity. And again, if you're a modern day practicing Jew, like a, a true practicing Jew, you you don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And I think one of the coolest group of people are Messianic Jews. Messianic Jews are Jews who still practice their Jewish traditions and religion, but they do believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And I still, I really still want to go to a Messianic like synagogue and go to one of their services one day because they still do everything as if they are traditional Jews, which in a sense they are, they don't deny their Jewish, Jewish heritage, but they are the, I would, I don't know what the percentage is, but I don't think it's huge, but they are the Jews who essentially are both. They honor their Jewish religion and heritage, but they accept that Jesus is the Messiah. And I think that'd be really cool to go experience that. Cause you're like getting the, the people that were before Jesus you know, before Jesus physically came, you're getting that whole culture and how they lived and what they believed and what they practiced. Um, and then you're also getting them admit confessing that they're like, but we also believe he is the savior. So I think those guys are really cool. I'll just, I just want to say that. The girl called him. I think it would be cool to practice keeping the Sabbath. Yes. After or the Shabbat. Yeah. After we heard that story from the guys on the Bible project where he said him and his girlfriend went to Israel and on Friday night, all the lights go out and everything shuts down for 24 hours. And he said him and his girlfriend were just like walking around the city, like holding hands. And he was like, it was just like a beautiful, amazing experience to see like everybody was at home and it was quiet in the streets and there was nothing open. I'm like, dude, that is really beautiful and cool I that would just probably be good for every culture to do right imagine it used to kind of be like that on Sundays in America but never like fully on you know but even that like honoring our Sundays has gotten less and less you know Sundays yeah it's noticeably different with traffic you you do notice on sundays it's like a lot calmer than an average day of the week but nothing like the actual like shutting down of everything i think every society should start doing it vote for steve just imagine a day that's nothing's expected of anybody and then it'd be like everyone knows like you know we got to make sure we have enough groceries for you know tomorrow there's nothing's going to be like every human's going to be off and able to spend time with their family and then you know everyone in your life is off, right? So it's like in America, it's gotten almost like it's hard to like be in a relationship or, or see your friends a lot because even if you're off, there's a good chance that your friend's at work and it's just too chaotic, man. Let's start the seven day. I say we do Shabbat seven days a week. Real Steve TV? Okay, too, too much. All right, so when you feel the call to Jesus follow him when you follow him he's going to say follow me you know he's going to say come follow me so back to verse 39 he said to them come and you will see so they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour one of the two who heard john speak uh wait what 
One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas, 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 which means Peter. All right, so um, we can probably end on this. But I wanted to just cover just, you know, we hear this word, we heard Jesus Christ so much that just to clarify, you know, um, Christ means the anointed one. So literally Christ means the anointed one. And then Christ is often interchanged with the word Messiah. Um, but Messiah means the promised deliverer of the Jewish nation prophesied in the Hebrew Bible. Okay, guys. So again. This has been prophesied before, many, many years ago, thousands of years ago, these ancient writers, Moses, uh, King David, these were prophecies that a savior was coming to save Israel. And then he came and he ended up saving all of humanity, right? But it's a big deal because these are the people, the, the Israelites, these are the people Jesus chose to come through into the world physically. This is why they're special. And they are, they will all, always forever be special to him. It's just the way God did it and designed it. And the sooner you accept that, the more peace you'll have about it. And I'm not going to get into the Israel-Palestine thing because I know that's where everybody wants me to go. Everybody wants me to get controversial. You're like, no, no one, no one wants you to get controversial, Steve. You're making that up. Okay. Um, and then Peter means rock or stone um so he changes uh simon right he changes simon's name to peter and later on as we keep studying john i think it's in the gospel of john but he tells peter i am going to build my church on you jesus is telling peter i will build my church on you and it connects to the rock and there's all this stuff and we won't get into it, but Jesus also referred to himself as the rock, you know, and we build our life on the rock. Um, but it's really an honor that like when you start to follow Jesus, he has a plan for your life. Peter's just a broken sinner. And as we see, he denies Christ. You know, he commits an awful sin. He denies Christ. And guess what? God forgives him and he still uses him for his kingdom because that's what God does. We're broken sinners. If we confess him as, as God, as Lord, um, he'll use us for his glory. And it's it's humbling and it's an honor. And it's unbelievable that he would, you know. And that's it. Um, any questions? Comments? I'm flashing back to when I used to be a teacher. Comments, questions, concerns. Um, does anybody want specific prayer for anything? There is power in prayer, guys. And... You can just leave something vague in the chat if you want prayer for something specific. You know, you don't have to get into gory details or anything. But if there's anything I can pray for you now live on stream, I would love to do that. Um, if you have any questions about what I've talked about, anything to add. Now's that time to get those comments in the chat, ladies and gentlemen. Bible study is coming to an end. We would love to do it all night. The girl called him. Please pray that I finish the semester with all A's on it. All right. Well, let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for this Bible study. Thank you for Thornsey. Thank you for the girl called him. And thank you for any other viewers who came in and saw this, Lord. I just pray that the seeds of truth will be planted in people. Um... And I pray that those seeds will grow into a plant, a flourishing plant. And, and that plant is, is faith. Um, encourage people, Father. Comfort people. And, and most importantly, Lord, I, I pray that you reveal yourself to people, Lord God. I pray, pray that you reveal yourself to Thornsey. And I also pray for us believers. Reveal yourself to me. Re re reveal yourself to the girl called M. There's always more to know and learn about you, Lord. And I just pray for um, Marisa, and I pray that she would get all A's this semester. I pray that you would give her the strength um, 
to study hard and often and put in the hard work you know in order to get all a's you have to work hard and you have to memorize stuff and you have to pass tests and write good papers and answer the questions correctly lord so i pray that you would give her the strength to work hard academically so that she could earn those a's father um and I just, again, I thank you, Lord. This was awesome. I thank you for Thornsey and the, all the questions and the discussion we had. That that stuff to me is priceless. Um, and I'm just grateful for it. But uh, yeah, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've been watching Real Biblical Studies International, the hottest in Twitch streaming online Bible studies.